Story 1. Tights and stockings at my all-girl prep school. They were a required part of our uniform until the faculty found out about a nifty study habit that was getting pretty popular. Writing crib notes on your thigh under the nylons. Then, during tests, you just had to cross your legs, maybe pull up the waistband, and the stocking would stretch just enough so you could see your notes. Story 2. When I was in high school, we got permanent markers banned. Someone organized a game of assassins where everyone is given a target to kill, and if you're successful, you inherit their target. It was $1 to enter, and the winner got the jackpot. We had around 150 students out of the 600 in the school participating. The objective was to mark your target with the sharpie on their skin, and they were then declared dead. This could only be done in the hallway or the cafeteria, not in class or off campus. Well, our vice principal decided she wanted to participate, saying that if she won the money, she'd use it to buy something for the school. Fair enough, we thought, so we let her in. Well, one of my friends ended up with her as a target, so in between classes one day, he sneaks up behind her and does his best Sam Fisher assassination attempt, grabbing her mouth and slashing her throat with a sharpie. Well, that was just too much emotional stress for our poor VP. She took his sharpie, had him serve in-school suspension, and forced us to discontinue the game. No more sharpies could be used by the students or staff. And no one knows whatever became of the prize money either. We kept it in a jar in our principal's office so no one could take it. So we all hated our VP even more than we did before. Story 3. Drug Dogs They started bringing in drug dogs in my sophomore year. They would smell the lockers and cars, and if one hit on your locker or car, you had to go open them up and let the school search it. By my junior year, a group of stoners had enough of it. They took bong water and put it in a bunch of spray bottles and sprayed it all over the lockers and as many cars as they could. My school had about 1,400 kids in it. It took one time of having 300 plus kids pulled out of class to have the locker searched to make them rethink the policy. What really got the parents to force the school to stop, though, was the cars. When drug dogs hit on a spot, they kind of go nuts. Imagine 25 plus cars getting a hit and having dogs scratch the hell out of the paint for a search that found nothing. There were a lot of parents that didn't push too hard, but some were demanding that the school pay for the damage. So, no more drug dogs. Story 4. The word buckle. I kid you not. Back in grade 7, a few kids in one class had it as a word on a spelling test and thought it would be funny to just shout it out randomly. The teachers, believing it to be a code word for something more sinister, decided to outright ban the word across the school. Needless to say, the faculty became the brunt of many jokes both from students and their parents. Story 5. Two-Way Hallways. Sounds crazy, right? The principal and his staff thought it would be a smart idea to have one-way hallways in order to cut down student traffic. If your locker was right around the corner and you had to go against the traffic in order to get there, you had to walk all the way around. If you passed your class on the way to your locker, you had to make two circles around the building. This significantly increased tardiness and write-ups. Terrible idea. Story 6. It doesn't translate well into English, but gay piles. Basically, if someone was on the ground because they fell or were wrestling with someone or whatever, this was middle school, someone would yell gay pile and everyone nearby would throw themselves in a pile on top of them. It wasn't a problem until some 20 plus kids decided to throw themselves on top of some poor guy. Story 7. Google. Our high school had some kind of contract with this really crappy school appropriate search engine called NetTracker. They banned using Google in school because it wasn't scholarly. Only NetTracker was allowed. They tried extending this to beyond the school. They wanted us to use only NetTracker for internet searches outside of school and sent home a pamphlet about internet rules outside the classroom. They said that students should not have Android phones. They said that students shouldn't have Android phones. I got a referral for having a Moto X smartphone. This was in 2015. Story 8. Blankets. It was in the South, and they keep the AC on too high because it's so freaking hot outside. Girls would wear shorts to be cool when outside, but they'd get too cold inside. 
thus the blankets to keep their legs warm in class. Of course, blankets are opaque, and they were already being used to cover up legs. Well, if a girl started sharing a blanket with a guy, yeah, things could get a little handsy. Story 9. Candy necklaces at my middle school. One day, a couple of my friends came into the playground before school started with a candy necklace each, which immediately got everyone's attention. After we all demanded to know where they got them and how much they cost, from the corner shop down the street and 10 cents as I recall, one or two others said they might go and get one for themselves before school started. That might go turned into them sprinting to the shop once one kid figured out how to weaponize them. Holding one piece of candy between their teeth, stretching forward the elastic and biting down, it would catapult pieces of candy at whatever it was aimed at. That morning, a few kids bought a candy necklace each and played a game of firing bits at each other. The next morning, all 400 kids that attended that school were engaged in an all-out necklace war. Every single one of us must have had at least one and our own technique for maximizing the firing rate. After doing our best recreation of trench warfare all morning and having the kind of fun that only comes with an entire playground full of kids all playing the same game, we were all ushered into the assembly hall to be told that candy necklaces were now banned. Nobody lost an eye, just in case you were wondering. Story 10. Pogs and Pokemon Cards in Elementary School Pogs because of those metal slammers they were afraid would be used as weapons. Pokemon Cards because kids like to show off their first edition Charizards. And thefts and buyer's remorse trades happened often. A lot of people have pointed out that Pogs and Pokemon Cards weren't a thing at the same time. That's mostly true, but elementary school for me was K-6. through Pokemon cards came out in January of 1999, which puts me in 6th grade. McDonald's did a big promotion for Power Rangers slash VR Troopers that involved Pogs. I remember being psyched about these things, and so were all of my friends. VR Troopers did not come out until 1994, which puts me in 1st grade at the very least. Story 11. Twisters. A weird dude in my class got a lot of laughs by letting people give him titty twisters. Apparently, after repeated and increasingly hard titty twisters, the connective tissue behind his nipple broke, so this guy could literally stretch his nipple 5 to 6 inches off of his chest. Obviously, being a teenager and a weird one at that, he went around showing everyone and their mother his new ability. He got warned about it several times, and the final straw was when he was seen by the administration with an equally weird girl his nipple five to six inches off his chest. They immediately banned titty twisters. But there was really no need, because we were all pretty scarred by what we had seen from this kid. I cannot believe I'm about to do this, but for those of you asking what this looked like, the best I can describe it would be an upside-down funnel. When he would pull on the nipple, all the loose skin surrounding it would come off of his chest and a sort of cone-shaped base would comprise the first three inches and the rest did pretty much look like D-nipples. It was probably a decent 3-4 to four inch diameter circle around his nipple of broken connective tissue, so I promise you, it came off his chest a solid 5-6 to six inches. Over three sports seasons during three years of high school, I can also tell you that it got to that point progressively. He was literally tugging on that nip in the locker room every single day, stretching it out. But hey, who am I to judge? I guess. You could only kind of tell that it was messed up before he would pull on it. So I'm not sure if that would eventually repair itself or just start to sag in the grossest way possible as he gets older. Well, I hope you're happy now, Reddit. I'm going to have PTSD nightmares tonight. Story 12. Any liquid not in a clear plastic bottle. And then the only liquid we could have was water. The ban was because a girl in my grade got caught with vodka in a clear plastic bottle. Everyone in my school never understood the ban because vodka is clear like water, and the only reason the teacher even caught on to her was because another kid was joking around about alcohol, and the with the vodka threw the bottle away in the garbage next to the teacher's desk. We weren't allowed to have water bottles at all. Same reasoning. A teacher took mine once when he saw me filling it at the fountain, saying, For all I know, you could have vodka in that. As I was filling it. At the water fountain. Time traveling me would go back and say, Oh, I, I didn't realize vodka came out of this fountain. But at the time, I was just too dumbfounded to be that clever. 
Story 13. Toasters. We got in trouble for making toast in a math class because our teacher was notoriously oblivious. Like, we full-on snuck a toaster into the classroom and made toast with jelly and distributed it under the desks two class periods in a row. After getting chewed out for being disrespectful, we then designed our class shirts with the come and take it flag with a toaster in the middle. The head of the school somehow didn't find out about the shirt design until we had them and wore them to school, despite the fact that he was a class sponsor. That is awesome. All the other common areas were taken, so my friend group would hang out at the front of the school. The VP told us we could no longer congregate there as we were a fire hazard. He threatened to write us up if we didn't disperse, even after we told him that in the event of a fire, we would be the first out of the door. This went on for a week until we got black t-shirts and printed fire hazard on them. We wore them a lot. He banned shirts that said fire hazard on them, so we printed shirts that said still not on fire. He banned amateur printed shirts, so we had them professionally printed by an internet company and kept the receipts with us. Eventually, the ringleaders got called into a meeting where the superintendent told him to stop harassing us. Didn't stop us from harassing him, however. Then came the shirts that said, Do work, Dennis. I do realize that we were a bunch of inflammatory little a-holes. Maybe that's why he was concerned. Actually, my best friend was a pretty decent graphic designer for a 17-year-old. Story 14. Cooking Class. Superintendent decided that, I quote verbatim, Cooking is an impractical art. Today, everyone can just buy pre-made meals and no one has time to cook, or they could be smart and hire a personal chef. This person makes over $150,000 a year after taxes and is in charge of three schools in the district, totaling 3,000 students. Story 15. Wearing a white t-shirt in middle school. Lived in an area where there was suburban, rural, and a sprinkle of urban within a 15-mile radius, so everyone got mixed together. Well, a small handful of the rural kids decided White Wednesday was gonna be a thing. You wear a white t-shirt to represent... At first, it was a small handful. Then the suburban kids saw a lot of people wearing white, so they did it too. Most not knowing why. Before you know it, things got bad quick, so the school said no white t-shirts. I'm completely okay with being proud of your race, heritage, etc. I'm Jamaican, and I rep the culture every chance I get. But being one of the few black kids in the whole school, it got intimidating. Especially kids yelling, I'ma paint this bus blue and spray the N-word on the side. When you're the only black kid on the bus, it's clear who they're forming against. Story 16. Sack whacking. Guys would hit each other in the bus as a prank, or whatever. Apparently, it was causing a big enough problem that the entire school had to attend an assembly where the deputy principal informed everyone. There has been a large outbreak of sack whacking. Entire school was laughing so hard, even the deputy, who was a really strict and uptight guy, started laughing his butt off. We were also banned from playing with large balls, basketballs, soccer balls, etc., at the same assembly. That was also received very well. Story 17. Shag bands. These plastic rubber bracelet things. Basically, if someone broke your shag band, you supposedly had to have sex with them. A natural law, according to some, but never, to my knowledge, ever enforced. The school got wind of it and became horrified that a bunch of 13-year-olds would ever think something like this was reasonable and came down on us with an iron fist. I vividly remember one teacher scornfully saying, so-called shag bands, and then spit in disgust. It was hilarious. Story 18. Any type of coin. Seriously. High school, about seven or eight years ago, I was a freshman eating lunch, and then heard some screaming and some kid being rushed out of the cafeteria. Turns out, some kid whipped a quarter across the cafeteria, and it flew kind of like a frisbee right into this kid's eye and sliced it, which completely tore it open. The principal talked to us all about it in the auditorium. He had to have surgery, obviously, and I think the victim's family sued the aggressor's family. I still remember I was eating curly fries and a slice of pizza that day. Wrecked. Story 19. Short Selling Stocks. Our class was the first to go through new mandatory financial literacy classes, 
and part of it was a stock market simulation. We began betting against the market when we set it up to crash specific stocks, and each time, our money rose exponentially. We had to fill out paperwork for each trade, which ended up amounting to around 30 pages of trades. At this point, we had trillions. Our teacher was also very condescending about how great she was at the market, so we then bought huge percentages of her stocks and sold them pennies on the dollar to crash her stocks as well. After a while, she checked everyone's progress and found we were trillionaires and went into a rage, even calling the company to see how we had cheated. They said we had short-sold, which technically isn't cheating, but she still disqualified us from winning the class game and gave us all Bs. Now, there's a disclaimer before every class that says you'll automatically fail if you short-sell. Story 20. Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic and Pokemon Cards some of the kids at school started trading and selling them during lunchtime. But it got so bad, as the kids were actually selling stolen cards they got from other students. My friend was swirlied one morning for his deck, and later that day he saw a kid with his Dark Magician card. He knew it was his because he had a tendency to chew the ends of his cards. The teachers put a stop to all of it, including playing the card games and bringing them on school grounds. Story 21 had this little Bible study group that would meet during lunch, once a week. It grew in size really fast, so some of the parents of the kids started bringing homemade lunches to give to the kids that attended. Anyone was accepted to join. They never ran out of food, and it was free, so kids that didn't have money or weren't on the food plan could eat something other than straight junk food. It was stuff like sandwiches and chips, but still better than the crappy cafeteria food. After a while, though, the group grew a little too big to the point where the school board found out about it and shut down the parents bringing lunches for the attendants because it was lowering the amounts of kids buying from the cafeteria. Ridiculous. After that, they instituted a rule that parents couldn't bring lunches to kids anymore. The overall reasoning was it lowered the cafeteria profits. So if you didn't have money or lunch, you were out of luck. If this was a public school, then that excuse they gave you was just pure BS. I'm on a school board, and at least for my school, the cafeteria doesn't have any profits. Any funds they collect for students who could afford to purchase lunches went right back into the food fund and was returned to ODE, Ohio Department of Education, at regular intervals. More likely than not, they were told that there could be some risk to having a Bible study group on school grounds, and they decided to clamp down on it before they got in trouble. Remember, many school boards are strictly volunteers who may or may not have any legal experience. They'd rather not get sued by a wayward upset parent when all the board is doing is volunteering their time. Story 22. Pens. I'm not joking. Kids would buy somewhat fancy pens and then there would be a bunch of trading and commotion. Dude, let me snag that uni ball. I'll give you two Pilot G2s. I remember there was a kid that everyone envied because of his Mont Blanc pen. Pretty soon, the school just banned using any outside pens and issued two of those crappy Bic round sticks. We were crafty, though, and started to replace the ink cartridges with those from our fancier pens. So, yeah, it was basically Prohibition, Pen Edition. Story 23. My whole life has led up to this question, and no one will ever see it. When I was in 7th grade, my principal banned flip-flops. My principal also happened to be my dad. When he came over the loudspeaker to announce that we would be banned from wearing them, he proceeded with, No thongs are to be worn around school because they are a tripping hazard. Apparently, thongs are what they called flip-flops in the 70s. I wanted to die. Story 24. Sweaters with zippers. A new progressive principal found a correlation between those dang hoodlums and zippered sweaters. Obviously, everyone thought she was insane, so we all put tape over our zippers. Took a week to get back to normal. Story 25. Candy canes. Apparently, they were a safety hazard because you could suck on them and sharpen them into a point, which could then theoretically be used to stab somebody. Most of our school suspected that it was simply a way of getting the Ugly Christmas Sweater Club, a group of guys who wore ugly sweaters to school and roamed the hallways handing out candy canes while playing Christmas music, in trouble. It was by far the dumbest thing to ever happen at my school. Story 26. Went to high school in UK, and everything branded wasn't allowed. 
No trainers, no branded hats. Backpacks need to be plain black. Only black dress shoes. Only year 11 students, 15 to 16, could wear plain black jumpers under blazers while the rest of us had gray jumpers. But eventually, when we got a new principal, and once they couldn't control people wearing what they wanted, they stopped caring. As to why, I don't really know the exact reason. Nobody told me. It may have to do with the fact that it was an all-boy Catholic school. Story 1. Not my story, but a close friend from back in college. He said that in high school, in one of his classes, his teacher was very, very deaf and couldn't hear in one ear, and basically was very, very good at reading lips. Come their first exam of the year, with the teacher standing in front of the room, kids started to just bow their heads down and literally speak out loud, What is the answer to 12? etc. Softly, of course. Apparently, soon enough, there was just constant conversation throughout the whole class regarding most questions. He said that soon enough, an assistant or another teacher would sit in during tests or quizzes once the teaching staff figured it out. I still find it incredibly amusing to picture a class of 40 kids talking during the test with the teacher standing right up front. Story 2 had a kid who would raise his hand and say something like, I need help with number 13, or whatever number. I'm a teacher's assistant. Either myself or the teacher would go over to him and tell him to speak out loud and give him whatever help he needed that we could give. I work in a special needs school, so sometimes they don't know definitions of words or struggle getting a point across if it's a short answer. It took me a few times to realize But about 20 to 30 seconds after this student would say that, another student would sharpen his pencil manually, and he would twist the pencil either once, A, twice, B, three times, C, or four, D, so that the other student could hear it. Imagine manually sharpening a pencil, that kind of click sound. The look on both of their faces when I took the sharpener away and told them to stay after class was great. Great way to cheat, though. Story 3. Not a teacher, but a story passed on by my father. When he was attending gymnasium, Germany's equivalent of a grammar school or a publicly funded prep school, history lessons were all about memorizing dates. The classroom used for history also had one large window, which the history professor usually had his back turned to while speaking to the students. This large window behind the history teacher would fog up in the winter. On one test day, Some students decided to write out entire events and their dates on the window, using their fingers. The history teacher passed out the tests. The window slowly fogged up, and behold, everybody in the class could see the dates on the window, except for the professor, whose back was turned to it. Once the tests were collected, the history professor finally turned around and saw the window. All he said was, that's good. The professor then graded the papers as normal. He must have seen too many instances of cheating that one finally impressed him. Story 4. I'm not a teacher, but two former professors of mine, who coincidentally shared an office, had great stories. They were both lit English professors, so they involve essays. The first was grading a student's essay and could just sense that something was off. It didn't match the rest of the student's writing. He simply emailed the student and asked him if there was anything he wanted to tell him. No accusation, but the implication was, I know something isn't right here. The student came in at his next office hours and confessed that another student who owed him a favor had written it for him. Because he had confessed right away, the professor gave him a second chance. Redo the assignment for half credit, and he wouldn't report the student for academic dishonesty. The student soon handed in a new essay, and the professor again sensed that something was wrong. So he did a little Googling. The student had plagiarized from Wikipedia, and not just Wikipedia, but the Wikipedia entry about Wikipedia. He reported the student. The other professor had a student turn in an essay, and again, his spidey sense was tingling. A lot of the citations and quotes were too perfect. But he did some Googling and maybe turn it in and couldn't find any evidence of plagiarism. In fact, that set him on the right track. The professor went to the library to look for the books and articles the student had listed under works cited and discovered that they didn't exist. The student had fabricated the whole thing. He did such a good job at faking the citations, he probably could have done the actual assignment in the same amount of time it took him to invent his sources. Story 5. 
chemistry class in high school. We had weekly labs that required a page-long summary of the procedures and results. We had groups of four, and I was the guy in the group that did the work while the rest mostly sat around and gossiped. Sure as shit, the day the lab summary is due for one of the more technical labs, Abby finds me before class starts for the day. Chemistry is five hours away and asks to borrow my summary. I told her not to copy it word for word. She agreed, and I got it back after the first class of the day. Chemistry class rolls around, and we all turn in our papers. The next day, we were working on a new lab when the teacher pulled me aside and asked me, Did you write this paper? I told him the truth, that yes, I did. He responds with a simple okay before pulling aside each of my lab partners in turn. I don't know what they told him, but after the last interrogation, he talked to all of us. All right, spring-loaded giraffe gets an A, Abby gets a B, Charlie gets a C, and Nicole gets a D. You got those grades based on the number of spelling and punctuation errors in your paper. Turns out, Charlie copied off of Abby, and Nicole copied from Charlie, and the teacher guessed correctly. This same teacher would tell the class before each test, remember, cheating only helps your grade. Story 6 in fifth grade, we had an economic simulation where we were supposed to learn about having a successful business. We made little goods and had fake money, and at the end of the year, we could use the fake money to buy real goods in an auction. I was very bad at it. So I stole one of the stamps used to mark the money, got a date stamp, and proceeded to buy Xerox fake money, which I mixed into the real money. I kept small bills, didn't make enough to be suspicious, and changed the date stamp to dates that were consistent with the real bills. I had one accomplice. I told no one else. I wasn't caught. And I got a set of bath gels out of it at the end of the year. Surprisingly, I am now a full-functioning adult and positive member of society. Story 7. My dad's a professor. When he gives tests to huge classes, he sets the students in seats according to their place alphabetically and distributes multiple forms so that no one sits next to anyone who has the same test, and he can know what test each student will be administered. Once, when he was grading, he noticed an abnormally low score, below the statistical guessing rate even. His general procedure in those cases is to check to make sure that a student didn't actually skip a bubble line on the Scantron sheet, etc. Well, this student didn't do that, but the answers were awfully similar to the correct answers to a different form. They were, in fact, identical to the test belonging to the person on the student's right. So my dad, being a quintessential geek, calculated the chance that the student would guess randomly the exact same as the person to their right. It was somewhere less than 1 in 2 million, and included this statistic in his Academic Integrity Violation Report. Story 8 Back in high school, our sole math teacher was horrid and was there only on a combination of tenure and because Jesus says it's mean to fire people. Catholic school. Going to her for extra help was of no benefit to anyone. I barely understood the math and 50% of the senior class was flunking algebra or pre-calc. I wrote an entire, admittedly simple, software suite for the calculators we all had to carry which would show tons of common formulas as well as do them out for you, explaining each step so you could show your work, as was always required. I had a link cable for the calc and doled the software out to jocks and dorks alike. Grades shot up, but the teacher started getting suspicious and required everyone to wipe their calc's memory and show her the big memory cleared screen before exams. So I wrote a program to fake that screen. A few people, myself included, had their GPAs saved. And now I build online training software and job aids, cheat sheets, as a career. Work smarter, not harder, kids. Story 9. When I was in high school, I had a really mellow biology teacher. A little too mellow. He was notorious for leaving the classroom during tests. It got so bad that when he left, people would just shout out questions and answers to one another. Hey, what's the answer for 41? Which has more legs, a centipede or a scorpion? I think it's a centipede. You sure? Scorpions have, like, a lot of legs, my dude. No, no, centi means 100, like centimeter or century. Scorpion has, like, 6 or 8 or something, not 100. General murmur of agreement. There was this kid in our class named Assad the son of some Pakistani general or something, who had some severe bully issues. Hey, punk walrus, you're the nerd here. 
Give me your paper, and he'd copy it. I got pretty tired of this, so I hatched a cheat of my own for the midterm. I asked the teacher if he wouldn't mind if I came in early and took the exam before school started. Then, when the second period came along, I'd turn in a complete zero in a fake paper. He agreed to it, but made me promise not to give out the answers to anyone, and trusted me. So I did, and I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. When class came around, that kid copied my paper, and even though the teacher actually did stay in the classroom, he kind of looked the other way with a smirk when that bully put his eyes on my paper. I mean, I laid it on thick. If a multiple choice had A, B, C, or D, I'd put an E on the Scantron portion. During filling in the blanks, he was just creative. Question. Name three types of plants. Answer. photo Nuclear power. Ford motor. He just copied it word for word, dumbass. So when it was time to get our grades, I got a B. Assad got a zero. Lowest grade I have ever seen, my teacher said. Are you trying to be sarcastic or something? For what does a mycologist study? You put my daughter's name. I'm calling your parents for a conference. This was a good 25% of our grade, and Assad was in deep shit. Of course, he was livid and stupid. He accused the teacher of fraud and incompetence. How could I have gotten a zero? Punk Walrus got a B and I answered everything the same. I'm also going to speak to your parents about your rampant cheating and summer courses you can take to make it up. Story 10. When I was in high school, there was this kid I called Chris. Chris was by and large a typical student. No weird dress, no bullying, no extreme displays of intelligence. He wasn't popular, nor was he a pariah. Not athletic, nor the fattest kid in school. His grades? Average. Just some A's and a few B's. But that changed quickly when someone discovered his dirty little secret. He was expelled for his actions. But I found him several years later, working at a gas station, going to community college for computer science. A fitting degree given his story. Chris would go to the school on a Friday night when everyone was at home and relaxing and enjoying themselves, sometimes around midnight. He parked his bike in the nearby streets and made his way to the school under the cover of foliage. There was a mildly wooded field near the school and find a small back door that led into the art and music section. He'd pick the lock on the door with picks made by hand and sneak right into the school. He would then use a specific route that was unsecured by cameras to enter into the teacher staff offices. All one room, lots of desks, and would do all manner of tasks. He would peruse the teacher's desk. If he found the copy of the test in question, he simply took out a portable scanner and began scanning whole tests. If the tests came out of the book, he would find any relevant sections and copy them down. Tests on CDs were extremely easy, he said. He simply used PowerISO to make a bit-by-bit -bit copy of the entire disc. But some teachers handwrote their tests. So he devised the craziest solution I have ever seen. He made a little piece of hardware that fit into the keyboards that logged every keystroke. Essentially, a modified, stealthier, and much smaller version of this. The result? Every week, he'd get a huge text dump of hundreds of files and would dig through them using a fine function available on any text editor, like Notepad. He could steal entire portions of tests effortlessly. Then, it was as easy as looking up the answers and memorizing them, copying them onto tests, and getting A's. The surprising bit? He actually learned the material better than many of the other more honest kids. How was he caught, you might ask? Well, there was a design flaw in his hardware that he used to log the material. The power necessary to run the keyboard came from the power that was supplied by the USB cord. It went in a reciprocating loop. If the hardware broke down, the circuit was cut, and the keyboard could not transmit data. At all. It would not even power up. The Spanish teacher, who discovered his ruse, took it down to IT. He thought that the keyboard needed a deep cleaning since he ate lunch and maybe some crumbs got in there. Okay. So they pop it open and they find his little chip, micro SD card and all, frayed somehow. So the principal orders the IT guy to open every single keyboard. They deduced who it was solely by the Cinderella principal. There was no other person in the school who had all those teachers besides Chris. He was expelled and sent to juvenile hall for six months, plus probation. In the end, the school basically revamped everything. They had cameras running 24-7 on all doors. TLDR, 
Former student of my high school custom built a keylogger with an 8 gigabyte micro SD card, broke into the school, installed them in the keyboards, and came back periodically to steal info for tests. Story 11. Not a teacher, but the best cheating story I know. So there were a bunch of kids in my high school who you wouldn't see in any class in the whole semester, but they would just turn up for the exam. Everyone knows someone like that in high school. Anyways, this one kid, let's call him Dave, shows up to an English exam. He somehow gets someone to pretty much do the whole exam for him, essay and everything, and he somehow manages to have them pass all of the answers to him. And all he has to do is staple the answers to the question sheets and hand it in. So halfway through the exam, he walks up and hands in his work. The teacher takes it, turns it around, and reads aloud, Pass this to Dave. Silence for three seconds. Teacher looks right at Dave. Dave looks at teacher, and all he can say is, Fuck. Story 12. I went to a private school that used the Abeka curriculum, so all of our tests were prescribed and torn out of a book. The school would order one book of tests for each student enrolled that year. At the beginning of the year, our class managed to get a hold of one of the test books. Not the answer key, just one of the books with all the tests in it. Before every test or quiz, they would distribute the blank one to me or the other nerdy kid in class. We split the test between ourselves, and the night before the test, we would research and answer the questions ourselves, then bring it to school for the rest of the class. The administration soon realized something was up because these other kids weren't too bright, never put much effort into the rest of their studies, and weren't smart enough to mix up their answers so as to not get every single one correct. Not to mention the teacher wasn't actually teaching the class. But that's another story. They had the entire class retake the test on the spot. Fortunately, because we were the ones who did the actual studying, and because we would learn the material instead of memorizing the answers, me and the other nerdy kid were the only ones who could replace our scores. So, they figured there must be cheating going on. Now, I should point out, I was very unpopular in school, never had anyone to sit with, and was always picked on or made fun of by the same kids who were happy to use me come test time. When Judgment Day arrived the day after the retake, the teacher pointed out that only two of us got the same score on the test. Then he basically says, Only two of you got the same score, and she has no friends and always sits by herself, so we know it isn't her. It was so humiliating, but bittersweet. I didn't get busted and never helped anyone cheat again. Story 13. Not a teacher, but similar story. In stats, a friend thought he could sneak in a burrito and eat it by holding it behind a movable closet that was situated against the wall he was sitting near. When the teacher wasn't looking, he'd bring it out and take a bite. When the teacher was looking his way, he'd discreetly hide it behind the closet. And since he was close enough, it didn't look suspicious. Teacher is at the board talking about Z-scores and statistical nonsense. And out of nowhere says, And Cam, throw away that burrito. You know there's no food in my classroom. It turns out, people have tried to use the closet in the same way in past years. So he set up an unsuspicious mirror in the back. It looked like one you'd see in any classroom, to spy on people sneaking food in. Imagine the look on our faces, when we thought he could see through walls. Story 14. I'm not a teacher, but yesterday my history class was taking a test, and the girl who sits next to me, she moved to the US from France a few months ago, doesn't speak very good English, and generally seems to be the typical hot dumb blonde type, took out a juice box. Then she opened up a small flap she had cut on one of the sides of the box and revealed the screen of an iPod Nano, the tiny new kind with the touch screen. She somehow emptied out the box, put her iPod inside, cut out a perfect area for the screen, and resealed it so it looked like new. For the entire period, I watched her scroll through notes on it and ace the test, by the looks of it, while I could barely answer a single question. But then, as she walked by my desk to turn in her test, she placed the juice box on my test. All the notes were written in perfect English, and included stuff I doubt even the smartest kid in the class knew. Today, our tests were passed back and she high-fived me when she saw we both got 100%. French girls, man.